but I want to share something I've been, actually I've been trying to work out which title to use, I've had a few titles, they're all very similar, but you know, whether to do, anyway, one, one t basically last week we were talking about the fact that um, one of the things disciples do is kick out demons, it's part of our, part of our job description, it's what we do, it's what we're called to do is to minister the, the kingdom of God and realize that in the kingdom of God we have a, an enemy and we are to drive him out and set people free and it's a part of our job description but it's not often you know that might not be something we talk much about with in terms of how to deal with demons and things like that you don't want to you know you sometimes think oh I don't want to get over into excess but one of the problems is by not talking about it sometimes people don't know how to deal with demons or understand so I thought I would share 10 and this is the title either 10 mistakes that people can make when dealing with demons and thinking about demons and their attitude to it. I was, I was going to say maybe 10 dumb mistakes people make when dealing with demons, but I thought that's you know, a bit rough, but that sounds better sometimes than 10 mistakes. 10 dumb mistakes that people make. Or I thought I could maybe put a positive spin on it and I might say 10 mistakes disciples don't make when dealing with demons. You like that? So, so 10 mistakes as a disciple. I don't make this mistake. Um, so you can take it whichever one. Look at the person next to you and work out whether you need to hear 10 dumb mistakes people make when dealing with demons or 10 mistakes that, that disciples don't make. Work out which one you want and then let's get underway. How many voted for 10 dumb... Oh, don't put up your hand. That's, that, that would be a dumb mistake in itself, wouldn't it? In fact, um, I like the number 10, but I've... I've got about 15 and I've trimmed them down to 10 and then I've got the 8 and then I've got them back up to 10. So, you know, it's not like there are the only 10. I've just tried to um, work them in and I got two or three more in the last five minutes that I was thinking, oh, I forgot to put those ones in. So you know, we'll just see. So I'll call it 10, but I won't number them maybe and then we'll just see how many you, and then someone can tell me then how many we got. Because there's a lot of mistakes you can make when dealing with demons. This is one of the issues. Um, I, I really do appreciate, um, uh, you know, <laughs> Let me just jump into this. There was one particular one about how we even re, re, um, we refer to demons and the concept, the biblical concept. And it, this actually really helped me. It framed the way I, I've been able to, to understand spiritual warfare and dealing with problems that uh, demons cause. And I was helped by this greatly by a man called Charles Kraft. He did not invent cheese. This is a different Charles Kraft. I don't know. Um, Dr. Charles Kraft, I'm, I'm going to guess. Um, he's a theologian. Uh, theolo he came out of the theolo theological side of Christianity, and he got thrust into ministering in the powers and gifts of the Spirit, and especially dealing with demons. So that's not your normal pathway. You don't normally go through that side and end up in this one. But it means that he brought all his theological way of um, processing and, and understanding scriptures and then applied it in very practical terms in areas of um, you know, working with demons. So his books actually can be quite um, deep in terms of how they handle um, scriptures and things. He really, you know, he, he's not like a, a fluff person. He's actually quite strong, but how he deals with it. So I had the pleasure of going and hearing him speak in Melbourne um, just over 25 years ago now. I'm not sure exactly when. Um, I, I, I sort of know the time. In fact, I ruined unintentionally, I ruined his time of ministry at the end of his sermon. Um, I went to a leaders conference, um, was at a Bible college during the week, so there's only about 20, 25 pastors there, and we had this special time, and he spoke powerfully, and he went into a time of ministry, and I think I ruined it, all right? Not intentionally, because I had a mobile phone for one of the very first times on my possession. How many remember the first mobile phones? Now, this was not the brick. This was the half brick, all right? Because I never had the brick. I looked at people who had the brick. It's like, oh. You know, how many remember the you know, young people, anyone under 45, you know, the whippersnappers? <laughs> they probably they won't remember, you know, the, the, the first mobile phones, you couldn't even clip on the belt because, you know, the, <laughs> the way you're over. I remember someone who had their first, the first mobile phone I ever saw, and this was, um, was someone he had in his, it was a car phone. It was too big to, 
carry with you, but it plugged into the car battery and it sat there. But it meant he could be on the road and take, you know, and actually had a proper handset, you know, you could plug a phone. So I wasn't at the brick stage with the big aerial. It had moved down into a small brick and you could still slide on your belt and it was good. But they didn't have near the features they have now. They're basically very basic. And um, I was still very raw as to how to use them, just learning as I go. So, but one of the first things I did, I get to take my mobile phone down to this special pastor's meeting. So, you know, Christine can contact me. I'm not out of contact. It's so new. It's so wonderful. So I'm sitting there at some of and they held the meeting at a Bible college, and they'd gone into a small, um, like, portable classroom. So they weren't in the auditorium. They're just in a classroom. And you remember those old ones? They had a little door and blackboard and 20 chairs. Well, this portable classroom had two doorways, one at the blackboard side, the, you know, the, where they spoke, and another door at the back. So when, they, when I first went in, I actually came in and realized I was standing at the very front, you know, as if I was the speaker. So I just took the chair near, so I'm right at the front. So he's speaking, you know, I could reach out and touch him type speak. You know, he's just sitting there talking, and I'm sitting right at the front. And um, others had came, come in through the other door and filled up, so that was all good. And at the end, it got to a very, um, very serious moment because he's speaking about you know, problems with demons and people getting set free, and he starts to have ministry, like if you've got any problems and we want to pray with you. So heads are, you know, it's quiet. There's no music, nothing down there. And guess what happens? You know what happens. <laughs> These things were loud. It's like, you know, bird on steroids. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, oh, it's me. It's on my hip, and so I'm grabbing this thing, and I'm trying to clip it off the belt. <laughs> And I'm realizing the longer this goes, the opportunity for ministry is going down. So I grab it and I press off or stop or anything I could do to stop it. And it's not like phones today, which have got half a dozen ways of being quietening down. They, you know, initially, there was only a few things that did. And one of them was you could not stop the sound once it was ringing. There was no way to turn it down. So I'm sitting there now, brr, brr, trying this, trying this, trying this, all I want. Now, if I had thought of it, oh, I should have answered it. Do you know what I mean? Because answering it would have stopped the ringing. But I didn't think of that. I was panicking. And I'm pressing every button, trying to turn it off, trying to find a way of turning this phone, and it's ringing really loud. So in the end, I look up, I thought, I'm just going to have to leave and take it with me. So I go to the door that I've come in, right next to him, not realizing that because of the way the meeting's gone, they've locked that door to only let people come in on the, um, the back door now. So I jump up and I run. And you know when you go to open a door and you're not thinking in any way it's going to be locked, you don't, you don't tentatively see if it... You sort of open it and go through, and you're going through and it hasn't opened. <laughs> so I'm like, bur, bur, bang! I hit this door, and then I'm trying to open the door, and I'm rattling the thing, and eventually I'm trying to get the lock. And I'm not going out that door. I'm not turning around. So I eventually unlock it, get there, shut the door and just walk off. And I've never gone back to that meeting, <laughs> never seen him again. I really don't know whether they had any ministry after that or not. Um, I just sort of feel I ruined it for everyone else. <laughs> Sorry, he might remember me, that's the thing. <laughs> I remember you. So if you ever watch this, Dr. Kraft, I apologize. I am the one that ruined that time of ministry and I'm really Sorry. And um, since then, we have learned, you know, phones have features like silent mode and all the other things that they probably be just for that type of situation. So he really helped me, and I'm sorry I didn't replicate and help him. But um, this is a great ministry gift. Um, because one of the mistakes, let's start with this. Let's just start right here, Dr. K. The thing that really impacted me was when he actually unpacked the phrase which I'd used all my life and taken from the Bible, which I thought was just a, a clever thing to do, and the word is demon possession. Okay, so I'm going to start with number one mistake that we as disciples, we don't make this mistake. We don't, let me get in the wording, we don't think in terms of demon possession, we think in terms of demonization. Okay, let me just say that again. We don't think in terms of demon possession. We think in terms of demonization. Because the Greek word, when it talks about demon possession, is not two words, demons and possession. It's one word predominantly, 
which is a daemonization, demonizai. I won't even try and pronounce it again because I don't think I've done a very good job with that one. But it's a, it's a single word which means that you are what? You have a demon. And there is another time when they actually reuse that phrase. He has a demon. All right? Um, or, and some people, well, does the demon have you? No, I have a demon. No, I think it's, uh, it has a demon. But that phrase of ownership came to mean demon possessed. Now, if you possess something, it doesn't necessarily mean that you, know, you totally own it if you possess something. But that con conception is built into our minds that we think of something when someone is, is dealing with a demon, that they are possessed. And the thought of someone being possessed is quite extreme. And with pe people in the Bible, we think, you say, tell me someone who was demon-possessed. And you say, well, the guy at the, the garden, uh, at the tombs, and, you know, he was, he was he'd naked and he'd cut himself and they'd try to put chains on him and he'd break the chains. He was demon-possessed. So anytime we think of this concept of someone being demonized or demon-possessed, that's the extreme level we're thinking of. But if we change our way of thinking and say, no, no, we're not talking about a possession, because when you think about it, even that guy who was cruelly and terribly you know, um, demonized and who was doing all these crazy things, he ran to Jesus and bowed down before him. Now, I'm telling you, if the demon was totally in control, he would have stopped that. How could, he, how could the demons... And even the, point, you know, the legion, there's many demons. How many you know, demons can come? And, um, but they can't stop this guy running to Jesus. So it's not a case of totally under the control of demons. But that guy was obviously heavily demonized. But the concept and understanding is having a demon. And the phrase I, I use now is they were demonized means that to some level, they are influenced and impacted by a demon. And the trouble is, if you just talk about demon possession, you tend to have them always, you know, if a scale of 1 to 10, they're always at 10. But there's other scales and other ways that demons can have influence that are nowhere near as extreme as that. But they can be dealing. But if your concept is only of number 10, you're blind to 1 to 9. Because you don't have a place for that. And if someone says, oh, I think I've got a difficulty with demon, and you think, oh, that's number 10, you pull back or the thought of not having it. For instance, let me give um, uh, an example. Um, well, remember the woman, let, let's turn to the scripture. Luke 13, verse 16. Now, this is not necessarily talking about a demon in terms of the terminology in the word, but it's talking about someone who's under the devil's influence in the, the role of the, the, the enemies having a, an effect on her. So I would put it under this level of demonization. In Luke 13, verse 10, he was teaching in one of the synagogues of the Sabbath, and there was a woman who for, for 18 years had a sickness caused by a spirit. All right? So that would be some, uh, she is sick, and it is caused by a spirit. So we put in that, I would say, she's been demonized. Oh, does that mean she's running around with shackles and breaking them off and you know, spitting and, and not able to talk and her eyes rolling in the back of her head? No, I would say that except for the sickness, she's a normal Jewish lady, except that she's bent over. But there's no other, no other signs of being demonized except in her sickness. But it's a demonic force that has impacted her, but it's only impacting her physically. Her mind is still clear. Her heart and everything else is fine. She's behaving normally. She can be a mother, a grandmother. She can do all the things that she normally does. It's just physically she is bound, but she is demonized. She has been impacted by a demon, and that is hurting and holding her back. And so Jesus deals with her, sets her free, and, um, and verse 16, I love what Jesus said when after he'd freed her. Freed her. Um, look, look at verse 12. When Jesus saw her first, verse 12, when he, Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. Now, he doesn't even rebuke the spirit that's causing it. 
He doesn't even deal with the demon. He just deals with the sickness and sets her free. And in verse 16, it says, This woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? Because, of course, the Pharisees, all they could see was he did it on the Sabbath, not the great miracle he was doing. So, but she, it's, in, it's, a, it's a spiritual problem, a demonic problem, but even when Jesus is dealing with it, he's not sort of saying, I'm going to cast out a demon. He'd actually cast out the sickness, which kicks the demon out. And um, there's another example of um, something like that where um, when the, um, the com- there's, a, there's a scripture where it says Jesus went up to a man who was mute and says he had a, a, a spirit of muteness, a demonic spirit of muteness. And he cast out, this time he says he cast out the spirit and then the man could speak again. So this time he deals with this, the demonic spirit and something he can speak. But there's no sense that the demonic spirit was doing anything except having a physical limitation on him. But if your thought, and every time you think of demonization, it's demon possession, you think, I'm only dealing with people when they're possessed. That means like, okay, we're going to take them in and we're going to have this big wrestle and I'll get 10 people to pray and fast and we will you know, lay hands and we'll talk to the demon and they'll speak back in alternate voices. And that's sort of the level that we're dealing with. That stuff does happen, and I understand that is part of kicking out demons, but it's the extreme level of demonization that you're dealing with. Generally, you'll be dealing with one to nine. And in fact, one to three and one to four can be going under the radar because you don't even know that part exists. You don't even think of demonization as having anything in this level because you're only thinking when it's extreme levels. You're not realizing that the demons can be having an influence and an impact and getting in and trying to work in a whole lot of other ways. So discipling is not just about dealing with the number 10, but we do not speak and use the language of demon possession because it brings, a, it brings an image that blocks out all the other layers and levels and that someone can be impacted and someone can be affected who are not in any way a rebel, rebel. they're not in sin, they're just, they're just being impacted. You know, look at that woman, there was no sense that she was in sin, there was no sense that she had done the wrong thing, it's just that a demon had, was causing it. There are physical things that we go through that have a spiritual cause. Is this every physical thing? You know, no, this is one, please, every, just to talk about this doesn't mean that we go overboard and every situation is a demon. So, oh, someone says, I've got a sore elbow. I cast out that demon of the sore elbow. Oh, yeah, I just bumped it on the um, wall coming in. Give it a rub. Oh, I think the demon's gone. It was a sore because I bumped it. It doesn't have to be everything demonic. But every now and again, you might be facing a situation in yourself or someone else, and you've got to be aware that there can be more than this one influence and more than one thing. And that demons can, what they look for is an opportunity to attach themselves to a situation. And so sometimes we've got to deal with what they're attaching to and what they're looking to hold on to. Um, turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians. Just make sure I'm getting the right references here. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Why it's not in 1 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And Paul is talking about a situation where they had to discipline someone in the church because of um, wrong behavior, immoral behavior. So there was a discipline, a separating of the the person from the church. But Paul was saying that it's terrible. I hate bringing this sorrow, but the sorrow gives the opportunity for repentance. And when there's repentance, then there can be restoration. Um, Let's read from verse 6. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted by the majority, so that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him so in other words, okay, he has been disciplined, it's been sorted, there's been you know, opportunity for repentance, 
But he said, now I want the, now that you've after the discipline, now we want the opportunity for restoration. But verse 7, so though on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him, lest somehow such a one be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. And for this, to this end, also I wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. But whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ. So he's saying, let's put this all right now, and I'm going to extend forgiveness through you. I expect this to be work. I don't want this to turn into a case where this person is now overwhelmed and they don't find any redemptive way back. So they feel hopeless and as if there is no chance for them to be restored. So that and, and possibly they'll become overwhelming sorrow, there could come resentment, there can come, you know, all sorts of problems in there. And and it, but look what it says, in order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his schemes. In other words, the devil can come and take this situation and take advantage of it. He can make use of what is happening here for his purposes. He can attach himself to the, the, the way someone is feeling, the rejection. He can attach themselves to someone who's feeling resentment or um, rebellion. Those are things that it, pride. These are things that the devil can find and make use of. If people are acting and behaving in a certain way, they're using immorality, those things the enemy can lay hold of. If people are making vows and making commitments, the enemy can say, well, I can take hold of that. If words are spoken, if, um, you know, if um, things that happen, and that can sometimes even flow generationally. You can find that someone does some terrible things and it affects the whole family. And the enemy says, there's an opportunity for me, I'll grab hold of that. Now, if an enemy comes in, it's not, goes, it doesn't go straight to number 10. It doesn't mean that that person immediately begins to froth at their mouth and begins to run around the tombs and cry out in strange voices and howl with the moon, at the moon. And it means that we don't have to send in a team and, and for deliverance ministry and set them free. Now, when I say this, please understand, I'm not against deliverance ministry. I'm just saying there is a whole scale up there the enemy can find a little foothold through pride, through rebellion, through a sense of um, uh, your self-worth in terms of, you know, you, you, know you, you can't understand how God can love me. That little, that little mindset, the enemy can come and reach hold and grab hold of, lock himself in, he can begin to influence you. And then sometimes the influence he has, you, it's not easy to make the connection. Uh, for instance, you might have pains in, your, in the joints of your hands and your fingers, and it's, you don't see any connection between a, um, an offense that you've been carrying and you've held onto an offense, which has also given a demon a room, a space to hold onto, and is causing pain in your fingers. So, what's the problem? Is it the demon? Is it the offense? Is it the joints? You know, you know, can you rub ointment on? Can you take medication? All these things can work. And every time I'm dealing with this, I'm not saying there is a demon involved in everything. But sometimes a demon gets caught up and uses that as an opportunity. So as disciples, we don't make the mistake of thinking that our behavior and the, the words we speak and the commitments we make and the choices we make do not give opportunity for the enemy to get in and to play a role in what we're doing. And so sometimes we've got to deal with two things. We've got to be breaking the connection that the enemy has got to that, as well as speaking forcefully to kick the demon out. Turn with me to the book of James, chapter 4. It says, resist the devil, chapter 4, verse 7. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's a good thing to do. Take a stand against him. Enough is enough is a good thing for Christians to say against the devil. All right? I know I'm taking a stand. Um, I'm using my faith. I'm getting in agreement with 
the word of God, the promises of God, I'm taking a stand against the devil. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's a wonderful promise. The devil, um, keep your finger in there, in 1 Peter 5 verse 7, uh, verse, um, verse 8, sorry, it says, Your adversary, your enemy, your opponent, the devil, what does he do? Prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Now, I've heard it said when I grew up, people said, Ah, the, the, the devil is like a lion, but he's a toothless lion because Jesus has pulled out all his teeth. And I thought that was wonderful. As a teenager, like, yes! But when I read this scripture a little bit later and, and meditated on it, I realized it doesn't quite match the scripture. Because did, Peter didn't say, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a toothless lion, seeking someone to gum. Because you've got no teeth! Because you know? <laughs> you know, that's what people say, you know, he's got no, he's got no teeth! But he's not looking for people to, um, to lick to death. Actually says he's looking for people to devour. And actually says in verse 8, the very first part, it says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. In other words, be really switched on, be aware your enemy is prowling around looking for opportunities to kill you and destroy you. Not to gum you to death, but actually destroy you. How does this work? So that's another mistake people make. They, they mistake the fact that they don't have a problem with the devil. Because of the cross, I don't have to worry about the devil. Well, this doesn't say that. It doesn't say because of the cross you don't have to worry. It says you have to be alert and aware the devil is still a problem. This is still something you need to be alert to. Why is that? I, I've listened to a, a preacher just recently. He was a very good preacher. Um, I'm speaking about salvation. And how, he said that... Um, Salvation, a lot of people think salvation is, a, is, is like in a, a timeline, like a line. I got saved, and here's the date, and here's the time. But he made quite a case from the scriptures that salvation is more like a flat line, that it's an ongoing process, not a, something that happened in time and space. And um, after listening to him and looking at the scriptures, I said, I think you're both right. So to me, salvation is a cross. There's a point in time when things happened, but it's not fixed to there. It's an ongoing process and a work. I was saved when I made this confession, but I'm being saved every day. I was baptized at that point, but I am being outworking that. So, I, so rather than see it as a series of events, I see it as events marked by a constant work. And in parallel with that is this understanding that the work that God has done in getting victory over the devil is a completed work. It's a finished work. It's a done deal. He's conquered the devil. But in 1 Corinthians 15, let me just read to you. You've still got your finger in James, haven't you? Don't lose that one. And 1 Peter. So you need three fingers now. 1 Corinthians 15. It says... Um, uh, da, 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 verse 24... For then, the end, then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom to God the Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And that last enemy that will be abolished is death. So Paul is talking about the, the victorious work of Jesus as he's finished it, but it's still to be finished. It's done, but it's still to be done. And if you read Paul's talking, he talks about the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a down payment of our final work of redemption. So I've been redeemed, but there's a redemption still coming. How does that work? It's a tension that's in the Bible of finished work yet to be finished. You say, how does that work? It just does. Completed work, but still to be completed. The devil is defeated, but he still needs to be defeated. And that victory needs to be enforced. You can, you can remind him of his defeat, but you need to enforce it in your life. 
You can point back to when it happened, but you can't say he was defeated at the cross. He's not a problem for me anymore. He's still causing issues. He's still causing problems. So a mistake is made that says the Satan and demons were defeated, therefore they are no longer a problem to me. No, they don't have authority over me. No, they aren't a problem in the sense that I can deal with them. But according to 1 Peter 5, verse 7, it says, I, might, I should be of sober spirit and on the alert because my adversary, my enemy, the devil prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So what should I do? I should resist him. It says, but resist him. Firm in your faith. So you stand fast against that. So in James chapter 4, so now we're going back in your fingers, you can go back to your last finger. James chapter 4 verse 7, it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Praise God. But you know that actually starts, that sentence actually doesn't start there. It starts with, submit therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Disciples understand that there is no way I can take authority over the devil and cause him to flee if I am not walking in good relationship with God. They, they go hand in hand. You can't be in rebellion against God and then trying to be dealing with the devil. He will find all sorts of loopholes and problems that undo what you're doing. But if you, res if you submit to God, if you put your life in good place with him, and I'm not saying perfect, I'm saying but perfectly forgiven. I'm not saying you haven't made a mistake, but I'm saying you're walking in grace and seeking for that grace to be manifest and worked out in your life. It says then you resist the devil and he flees from you. So my understanding of demonization is that I can be struggling and having issues with demons at the level one or two and three. I'm not in rebellion. I'm not causing trouble, but he can be still finding little areas in my life of unforgiveness or bad attitude or wrong thinking or pride or greed. And, I, and, the, and so never, never lock the Holy Spirit out of helping you. In fact, if you go back to um, first, uh, 2 Corinthians 2, so we've gone all the way back over and then we're coming all the way back. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I think this is really interesting. I, well, I always thought this was interesting. Um, verse 11 says, In order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. We are not ignorant of his schemes. The word schemes and the word that makes up not ignorant actually are very similar. In the Greek, there's a, a real sort of connection. So I like to put it like this. I have strategies for dealing with the devil's strategies. All right? I'm not without a strategy for dealing with the devil's strategies. The devil has a plan for you. The devil has an option. He's trying to work in your life. You need to have strategies for dealing with that. You need to know how to deal with it and what to do and what to share. All right, let's just finish with this. Let's just go to Luke chapter 4. What's our, how, how do we, what's our, in, our takeaway from here? Is our main role as disciples to go and find the devil? and kick him out. No, it's actually not. Our main role is to exalt Jesus and to lift up the, the kingdom of God and his, his name. In fact, when, when the disciples got back in Luke, um, let me just have a look. I think it's chapter 10. Yeah, Luke chapter 10, the disciples returned. This, this is when he sent out the 70 or the 72, and they said, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They were excited. He said, you know what? I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And I've given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall injure you. He said, you know, that's exciting. But he said, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. 
In other words, Jesus said, don't get too caught up in all the authority over the demons you have. See, that's not the focus. The focus is what I'm going to do in bringing you into my presence and the rescue you have to other people. Our aim is not to go out there this afternoon and find as many demons as we can. Let's round them up. Let's have a contest. Who can find the most demons? Now, if we go out there and there are demons in the way, yeah, deal with them. But we're not going to look for the demons. You know what we're going to do? We're going to do the same thing that was the, the, the task of Jesus. And as his disciples, we do the same thing. Because Jesus said in verse 18 of Luke chapter 4, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That is my message. That is what I'm doing. Now, if in doing that, I meet situations where people are demonized from level 1 through to 10, I deal with that because I've been given authority to kick that out. I don't hit that and it becomes a stone wall. The problem is if you don't have a strategy for dealing with the devil, you can be facing everything and trying to deal it on an emotional level, trying to deal it on an intellectual level, trying to even deal it on a, a level of your, your faith, but you don't realize you've got to resist. You've got to kick out. You've got to drive out. How many times? Resist the devil. Push back on him. So if you put all that side, you only have a window where things don't have a demon, you know, demonization sort of influence to deal with something. And that can do work. You can help people. You can minister to people. But, oh, it's so much better when you have a strategy and an awareness in the spirit that ah, uh, we're hitting a, a wall here, and you suddenly say, let's just pray about this. Let's just get to the bottom of this. It might be a situation you're facing or a family member or a neighbor, and you pray, and the Lord says, and he drops something in your heart, and he says, what's your relationship like with your father? And they say, oh, my dad beat me up when I was a child. Oh, have you ever forgiven your dad for that and sort that out? Well, let's deal with that because you know what? That can be impacting you now, not just in the emotional hurt, but there can be things that have happened in that. And, I, and, and it's, those things need to be dealt with and processed and properly and there's ways. But there's things that are having like a, a hold that the enemy is going to... as much as you try and help, you say, now let's drive this out in the name of Jesus. Let's speak to this in the name of Jesus. Satan, you've, you've used this situation too long. We're going to drive you out in the name of Jesus. We're taking authority over you. We have been given the power of God in Jesus to get the job done. What I'm saying is in Luke chapter 4, when it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. In other words, we are the same anointing upon us to get the same results done. And if there is anything that is a problem of demonization, we deal with it. We resist the enemy and it says he will flee from you. He will run from that situation because he's been exposed and he's been presented with the authority of the finished work of Jesus. The resurrected power of Jesus is working in me. The glorious working of God is now coming through me and we deal with it. But we'd be amiss to sort of say, well, let's not talk about that because that's a little bit uncomfortable and people can get into excess. Well, so dumb people get into excess, but good disciples don't make the mistakes of not realizing that we have an enemy and how we deal with him. So your, your task is not to go out and find as many demons. Your task is to go out and set as many people free, bringing the gospel of the good news to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And if any demon gets in between you and that task, you've been authorized to drive them out. If any demon stops you from getting that job done, the same as when Jesus sent out the 12 and when he sent out the 70 and he gave them authority because as you go, he says, I'm giving you my authority to deal with that. So if you face a situation, you just deal with it. You take authority over it. You're like, you, 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 you're not that person who's silly enough. In Ephesians 6, Paul says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But we wrestle against principalities and powers. So I'm not so foolish as to realize everything I see is the real problem. Sometimes things have to be dealt with in the heavenly realm. I'd like those that are appointed. Um, we've got communion here. I'd like to, for us to, to take this. Maybe, um, Mark, would you just be able to serve people on one side? And is it, Roger, could you just maybe take that and just serve people if they want? 
I'd like to give you the opportunity. We're going to take communion. You know, things like communion really hurt the devil, upset the devil, because it's a reminder of our victory. It's a reminder of, this, of the, the work that Jesus has done, the shed blood. Oh, the power of the blood. But you know what? The, um, we're not going to take communion to hurt the devil. I, I, I trust it does hurt him. I trust he does infuriate him. I trust it weakens the power he has over certain areas of my life. But we're not taking communion and keeping our eyes on the devil. We're taking communion to remember Jesus and what he's done for us and the victory he's brought for us and the fact that because of what he has done, I'm no longer under the devil's dominion, under the devil's tyrannical rule. Acts 10, 38 says, Jesus went about doing good and healing everybody who was under the devil's terrible rulership. The Greek word there is tyrant. The devil is a tyrant and Jesus has set me free. This is our liberty. This is our freedom. This is our ability to serve God and minister to him. But we want to take our freedom that's been provided for us in these elements. The broken biscuit representing the broken body of Jesus that took stripes for us. By his stripes we are healed. The cup representing his shed blood. No covenant can be put in place without the shedding of blood. And this blood was shed for me to pay for my sin and to bring me into perfect relationship with God. Thank you, Lord, for the, the broken body. Thank you, Lord, for the shed blood. These are what I celebrate. These are the things that you've freely given me and you've blessed me with. But there is one scripture which drives me so strongly. It says, freely you have received, freely give. I am not satisfied just to enjoy the freedom of this meal myself. Use me, Lord, to bring freedom to others in Jesus' name. Let me not only enjoy freedom from all of Satan's attacks and anything that he's trying to put a hold of me, but Lord, let me also enjoy a freedom that I bring to others and use the authority you've given to me to drive out any demons that I encounter and set the captives free. In Jesus' name. Let's eat and drink together. I'm just going to sing one short song. Caleb, if you can just lead us in something. I just want to give a moment. There might be someone who particularly, you say, this is my moment. I want someone to lay hands on me and to get an agreement with me. We don't ever want to let this opportunity pass. I never want to leave a meeting. You know, the worst thing is for someone to come into a meeting sick and leave the meeting sick. It shouldn't happen. Come in. Let us lay hands and let's believe God. Anoint with oil if necessary. See you whole. Or if you're battling something or you need help with something, we'd love to help. So as we sing this song, I'm just giving you this moment, if you'd like to come down the front as I minister to you. Thanks. Bring it in.